G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. Today we are doing the impossible task of ranking the top 30 forwards. Good luck to us. Let's go! Hey, you leave and, the button pressing to me, mate. And welcome to the Ball Boys AFL Fantasy Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. I'm joined once again in the preseason to finish off these forwards, these bloody forwards. Luke oh. Rogerson, mate, how are you? Oh, I was good till you started telling me how to do my job. Yeah, well, I got one job. It's pushing uh, buttons, and you're trying to. You're leaving it late. You make me nervous. I thought yeah. our beautiful faces weren't going to be up I, there on time. I do encroach on your job sometimes. I do reach over and start pushing buttons over here. But uh, yeah, you, you stick to your buttons. I'll push my buttons. What's going? Why you got the lights turned down in here, mate? Why, what are you trying to set the mood here? You're trying to set make a pass on me? What's going on? <laughs> well, you, you know. Sicko? High budget production over here at the Ball Boys HQ, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, one of the lights has gone out on us, so a little bit of more of a dim look for today. But yeah. we don't we don't stop for anything, <laughs> you know. The show goes on. Maybe it's because we only paid fifty bucks for the lights. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty more, fifty bucks more that we've uh, not made on this podcast. But uh, <laughs> let's let's uh, let's push on. And uh, in this dimly lit room, we're going to talk about. The forward rankings, top 30. I, I mean, I tried to get 30 players out. Um, I hope they're all forwards, but it's it's a tough tough gig. It's if you haven't done it yourself, give it a try and um, let me know what, at what point do you give up uh, because this is, there's a, I tried to break, break it into tiers as well and then by the end there was just this one big clump, basically half the rankings in an entire tier because... Oh, yeah. that's, uh, that's the definition of fence sitting. <laughs> so, um, control yeah. C, control V, dump yeah. them in there. It's, um, it's, it's dire and... Um, Look, we went through this in the in the premiums, but again, if you uh, if you haven't seen all our premium videos and our mid price forwards, go and check those ones out for the classic information. This is a draft rankings, but it can still also have some value for classic as well because you'll see where exactly I rank these players um, compared to some of the other guys you might be thinking of picking in your classic team. Um, shall we get stuck into it? Let's do it, man. Tier one, two players. Number one, not head tilt himself. I'm going with Sam Flanders, Oy. who I think is the top. Uh, averaging forward this season. Now, in Classic, I think he's a harder sell because of that early buy, but in Draft, I'm not really considering that very much. So yeah. um, I've got him at number one, and in the same tier with him, I do have Jack McRae at number two. So Sam Flanders one, Jack McRae two. Do you agree, disagree, think there should be someone else in this tier with them? What about uh, what about that moist start for Flanders that we, we identified? And what, I said we identified, Bales identified for yes. us. What a legend. What, what about that run to start the season? Does that sway you in any way? And I think it might, it might sway me more in a classic because in a classic you want to get off to a hot start. In a draft, you've got him for the entire season. Slow you're, not, you're not trading him in and out. Like You're going to get the average all, all up and about. And, yep. and whilst it is like something that takes a fraction off his ceiling. Like he's still, if he's got an inside mid roll, which I kind of expect him to at least have a decent chunk of, yep. I think still think he's going to be enough to score. And I just like his upside more than a Jack McRae because of his coach. Um, and, yeah. uh, and, and just he's, he's younger. He's got, you know, just a bit more thirst, I, I think as well. Um, less sulking, less head, head tilts at this stage of his career. So, And he's a guy that, it, I mean, like you're comparing him to McRae, it, even if Flanders is playing a high half forward role, you back his ability I do, to go yeah. and find points in some way. But um, I think it's shown with the last little bit with Jack McRae that if he's not exactly where he wants to be, then yeah. there's no points to be had. Yeah, and yeah, I just think that even though this is tier one, I'm, I'm tie-breaking it with upside. Um, yeah. oh, McRae, you could say, is like the higher floor, but I don't even know if that's true because like what you just said, mm. even in a not ideal role, Flanders, I feel, still think, can can score. And based on what we saw at the end of last season, he is going to be very much involved in this team. And he's he's shown an ability to move up the pecking order in terms of the, like getting him the ball. What have you got for um, Flanders' projected average? What are you getting projected oh, at? I think you can go close to a ton. I think you can go close to 100. Um, I think that gets it done for, for F1 this season, which was sort of like so our F6 affairs. kind of bare minimum last year. Yeah. Um, so I think Jack McRae is like a mid-90s. Flanders... 
I think is high 90s to 100 depending on the role. Um, but at the moment, I am forecasting that the role will be positive and yep. that he will get maybe you know a low 100 to high 90s would yep. be what I'd say. And then dropping into tier two, you've got Taylor Adams and Dylan Moore sitting here. What, what's your rationale for not putting them into tier one? Well, I, I don't think that... Dylan Moore is going to have the role that we would like him to have, which, again, just gives me a little bit of a pause in terms of his upside and also just his like consistency uh, when you are that high half forward, no matter how good you are, especially, you know, Dylan Moore is one of the best in the game. Mm. He's still prone to more volatile scoring and um, does rely on, I guess, a bit of the game script, I guess, like a bit of like how Hawthorne are going as a team. And obviously that has not been the best the last two seasons. Um, so I think he's a safe pick and I really yeah. rate him as a guy that you can just lock in 85 to 90, he's going to get you that. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't expect him to be a huge feature in their midfield. And without that, I don't see much more upside from there. Yeah. And Taylor Adams, um, I think we discussed this in the in the premiums, but he historically has needed like 75, yeah. 80%. And I think Sydney's midfield is just deeper than people are giving it credit for. And I don't know if he's going to get that. I think he's probably more around that 60% mark, which is might, might be good enough for a 90 Low 90s, um, but I just don't see him getting to the heights that McRae and Flanders could. That's kind of the question I can't get my head around with Taylor Adams as well. Is like we, we feel as though, like you said, he needs the really high CBAs, 80 plus to score the, those figures. It's when you ask yourself the question, well, who misses out that it starts to become hard in that Sydney midfield, doesn't it? I think yeah. it, you know, the fact that they've also added James Jordan, who we suspect might s- spend a little bit of time in there. Just, yeah, a little bit, you would have yeah, to think. It, I mean, it just probably, yeah, I think I agree that he um, probably knocks him out of that first tier. Yeah, and even if he looks good at the start of the season, like what happens when Callum Mills comes back into the squad as well? Yeah. Uh, and plus you've got to factor in with the draft ranking. His durability has been a concern these last few seasons. Again, you've got him for the entire season if you're drafting him. Um, less of an issue for Classic because, you, again, you can always trade him out. And if he is popular doesn't affect you as much. But if you're the only person in your league with Taylor Adams, it's a little bit nerve-wracking because he hasn't been able to stay super healthy these last few seasons. So yeah. another thing that probably separates him from tier one into tier number two. Before we go on to the next one here, I just want to give a few little shout-outs here to a few legends who, we haven't done this a, a bit on the podcast before, but I want to give a, a shout-out to a few guys who have given us a five-star rating and review over on Apple Podcasts. I particularly like um, this one here, which says, hold on, I've just completely lost it. <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> Mitch is the best. Yeah, that's a nice one. Right at the very top there. Can't get enough of this podcast. Mitch is the best. Shit taste. Great. <laughs> Great <laughs> comment by P, P. Drack over there last year. P. Drack. Uh, P. Drack. That's a rap artist. Yeah, what a legend. Um, uh, from Poker Guy 6210 love the pod and the banter. Only complaint. I wish they went longer. Mate, can you go longer? No. Nope. No? Nope. <laughs> That's never been my forte. Short and sweet, <laughs> That's what I always say. Uh, it's not how long it goes, it's how, how well it is at the time. Uh, can't get enough. <laughs> Cheers, fellas. Keep it up. That's a lovely uh, one. And this one here is the one that I mentioned before. From Mojo289, entertaining listen and plenty of stat-based analysis. However, though, uh, he needs a hand with his team, the Ox Smalls. Uh, keeps falling short and a constant disappointment. Well, I don't yeah, know if we can help him there, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, thank I, you for I the kind, the, kind comments. The funniest part of that is stats-based analysis. Shit talk might have been Shit talk and fence sitting, I think, <laughs> yeah. is our specialty. But uh, no, I appreciate the kind comments there, guys. And if you haven't, um, would be awesome if you guys wanted to support the show to head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star rating and uh, review over there. And if we see ones we like, we uh, might read it out and give you a bit of a shout-out on the podcast. So, And uh, if you're on YouTube, thumbs up, subscribe, and all that good jazz. Tier three, we've got starting to get a few more players here. We're still yeah. not going to go past the top 10. So this is still all F1s, essentially. Caleb Daniel at five. Toby Green at six. Yep. Our very own Shea Bolton at seven. You know, the man himself is aware of his own hamstrings, Zach Fisher at <laughs> eight. And at number nine, we've got D Martin, the uh, three-time Norm Smith Melodist. Um, so still uh, in our F1, but... Starting to get a little bit down towards <laughs> Zach those. Zach Fisher at F1. Yeah. In your <laughs> I know, draft right? Team. You um, beauty. <laughs> so, this is obviously last time we spoke about yeah. Jack Fisher, we were under the impression that he had, you know, torn his hamstring or, or sprained his hamstring. Comes out that it wasn't a sprain, it's hamstring awareness. I what think, are we thinking with that news? 
I think it's worse to be aware of your hamstring. Because do you really think? Well, if you're aware of your hamstring, it's about to go. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? It's like, oh, I'm aware of my hamstring. So it's about to go. But if it's gone, at least we know. Okay, it's done hamstrings in three weeks, whatever. But if you're aware, you don't know when it's going to go. Oh, well, that uh, thing could fuck you up. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, what I if don't you, know if what I if you, agree with that. What if you're drafting Zach Fisher? You're like, oh, the unknown. He's aware of his hamstring. And then round two, boom, dead. At least if you know straight away, you don't pick him. No, nah, no, nah, I, I still back him in. I think we're all at one point of our life aware that we've got hamstrings. And uh, look, he's flags it now. <laughs> hey, oh, what are these things behind my leg? Uh, um, I think it's fraught with danger. I, I, I still think it's something that I'm definitely considering. And I still stand by if he plays a preseason game, um, that he will be a consideration for my classic side. And if he does play a preseason game, this is where I would um, draft him or rank him in my draft because I'm assuming he will be ready by the time we are playing preseason games, which is probably about a month's time uh, away. So uh, still got sure. four weeks to get himself healthy. So I'm, I'm not too concerned. I reckon he's got you on the hook. <laughs> Recycling. Recycling over here. Um, <laughs> talk to me about the two uh, Richmond boys. I've got Shea over Dusty. They were flipped in their average from last yeah, season. Yeah. What do you think? Do you agree, disagree? Do you not want anything to do with them? Are you bumping them up because you're a Richmond stan? Uh, no, I'm not bumping them up. I think that it's where you, where you draft these two guys, I think, is at the moment a little bit based on speculation because we've got a new coach, yep. um, what roles are going to be played. So like we know that if Dusty plays predominant midfield time, he's... Pretty safe around that ninety, you know, ninety-five guy potentially because we identified. I think that he played very little midfield, very low time last CBAs, year yeah. And actually, had a reasonably yeah. good year in terms of points from you know from his standards. Yeah. But if perhaps new coach comes in and says, Shea Bolton, you are the man. Get in there, eighty percent CBA, just yeah. do your thing. Then there's the potential for him to just absolutely pop as well. So, um, I'm a little kind of on the fence, which is so uncharacteristic of us. But <laughs> sound like you at all, mate. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, it really is. It is new coach dependent, like a lot of the things we talk I've about. I've kind of just put Shea ahead of Dusty just because he's six, you know, six or seven years younger. Um, yeah. and just sort of oh, you're drafting a keeper league. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you got your keeper league. Hannah, he is in my keeper for, league. So <laughs> love me, love me some Shea. But he, uh, yeah, I just think that I feel a bit safer with him being a younger player and he probably still has a little bit of ceiling. He, he actually made a decent jump last year in his average, went from mid-70s to... The, I think it was 86 or something he averaged last year. So I think he still is ascending, still getting a bit better. Um, so I can see that happening. Caleb Daniel and Toby Green are just kind of... I've got them falling back a little bit, but still, I think, very important parts of their team that they'll kind of do mm. roughly similar to what they did last season. Um, yeah, that's tier three. Oh, we are flying through. Flying through. Tier number four. We are now starting to get into the F2s for draft. So at number 10, <laughs> I've got... As the dog shit. As the dog shit, the yeah. Dog at shit number pits. 10, I've got Luke Jackson, the first key forward here. 11, Jeremy Cameron. At number 12, Isaac Heaney. 13, Josh Rochelle. At 14, Charlie Curno. And at 15, I think he might be a bit of a my guy this season. Oh, Connor right. McDonald is at number 15, just sneaking in the bottom of tier four. Um... So a few young players, a couple of young players in Rochelle and McDonald we talked about in the mid pricer yeah. And then a few of these, you know, better key forward types in the competition that um, will have high ceilings when they verse teams like North Melbourne and West Coast and can go missing from time to time. So yeah. their average will look good at the end of the season. They might not be the kind of players that you plug into your, I mean, depending how dire your forward line looks, it could be, but they might be sort of like that matchup based play that can go huge. Yeah. And that can, on any given week, really swing your draft matchup. I mean, that's a, that's actually not a bad sort of point to talk about here. Is like because we're so, um, you know, low on forward stocks this year from a draft perspective. Could you just look at that last spot in your forward line as a guy that you just plug and play each week and look to pick? It's it called the waiver wire? Is that, is that yeah, the yeah, NBA? yeah, like waiver wire. Yeah, pick yep. up off the off the scrap. A hundred percent. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> you will that? be. You'll be streaming forwards a lot in your draft streaming. leagues. Yeah. All the vocab, uh, mate. mate, mate, this is my you'd this be, is my bread and butter right here. Draft guy. Uh, yeah, you're streaming forwards, and I do want to point out that for Charlie Kerno in particular, mm. his last three matchups, which is more and often than not the fantasy draft finals, he goes Hawthorne. West Coast and St. Kilda. So especially Hawthorne and West Coast. Yeah. I think those are juicy, juicy matchups. So, so um, as a, like in a league, 
how long are you waiting before you go, fuck, I might just have to get him and hold him. Like, I, I'm not going to be able to put him back on the heap because someone will get him. Uh, well, no, I think you're drafting him. You're, you're not, you, you're not you dropping you, him. You just hold him. You're holding him. Like, you, okay. you, you plug and play. Because, like, he last year, I mean, he, he yeah. averaged 86. That's true. Um, he, that's, he ran away with it. And in terms of the average, that is right up there. So, his, his lows are... You know, it's a key forward low, but it, they're, they're better than other key yeah. forwards. Um, and when he kicks the bag, he, he's going to go big, big time. What um, Do you think of all the key forwards, Jeremy Cameron is the guy that has the ability to potentially sustain a really high... Like we show, yeah. he showed at the start of last year. What did he... For the first few he rounds... He was averaging he was, like 100 and something for the first several weeks. Yeah. yeah. So so what do you think that's down to? Is it just can these big forwards just get in a, at a you know rich vein of form and... Well, he, he's a t- kind of type that he really gets up the ground. Oh, like he he, he the ground. takes marks inside defense of 50. Yeah. Like he's sometimes used more as a wing. So, um, yeah, to, to reference your point from last season, he started with 85, 138, 101, 137, 93, 87, 82, 83, 82 before he dropped his first score in round 10 under 80. And um, in his average, he actually has a minus three in there as cool. well. So um, got to take that into account that obviously he averaged at 83. Yeah. But there was a game where he actually <laughs> pulled his average Five backwards. Uh, so yes, he. I think that 83 is unders what mm. I expect him to average. So I think he's more of a 85, 86 type of player. Yeah. Um, despite him being 31, I still think he's going to pretty much do what he did last season, which is up there with with some of the best. When you when you're speculating in your drafts, because you, you're the draft guy, I'm, I'm asking questions. What when you you're speculating with your forwards and stuff? Do you think there's room to speculate on roles? So looking at names like Rochelle, um, you know, name, I mean, Toby Green, not so much, but if he ever went into the midfield, these guys, do you think that you should speculate on these small forwards that we think may eventually become midfielders just in the hope that they do this yeah, year? Yeah, it, it would depend on where you're drafting your forwards and how deep or how late you're going to leave it because we're doing these rankings in the forwards, right? And yeah. But... You're drafting not just forwards, you're drafting midfielders, defenders, rucks. So when I'm looking at these players, like my confidence in them, you know, getting the role, sustaining yeah. that role for the entire season is quite low. So the upside is there, but the floor is also really high. So the rule is always the later you get into the draft, um, just in total, like the further you get down yeah. each round, the more I'm happy to take a punt. Okay. So for that reason, I do think that forwards just in general, they should all really be drafted later, even though there's okay. like maybe a clear gap between someone like a Taylor Adams and a, yeah. you know, like a, a Josh Rochelle. I'd much rather wait till later in the draft and get a Josh Rochelle because, you know, their ceilings might be comparable. Yeah, it might be less of a chance it happens, but I'm not giving up as much draft capital if I'm waiting another 40 picks or so to, to get him. So how, how many picks are you taking before you take a forward off the board, roughly? It, it really depends on, like, what is available on the board and my confidence. So, like, for example, at the start of the draft, I'm picking those big ruckmen, um, the Dacos types. I'm loading up on gun mids who are going to average 110, 105 plus. Yeah. Then I'm probably looking at my defenders who I think can average 90 plus. Okay. Then I might start to look at some forwards. And I might start to look at some forwards once I've probably got two midfielders, my ruckman, a defender... I'll entertain and start looking at my forwards. Now, there might be some exceptions, especially depending on when you're drafting. If Sam Flanders is killing it in those preseason games, he's a midfielder, it looks solid, yeah. then he might elevate to right up the top there and he might be a second-round guy. But it really depends on your confidence. And my confidence in these forwards, at least early in the draft, is low. So I'm going to just avoid them because there's more risk of being burnt with less value to gain early in the draft. Okay. Yeah. Well summarised. Um, you can't lose your draft. Can't win your draft in the early rounds, but you can sure as fuck lose it. Um, oh, is, is the old rule. Bit of Mitch wisdom. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so tier five, and this is my final tier because I've got fifteen players in this tier. This is where I throw the blanket over. All these guys, I think, can be sort of 70, 75 ish kind of average. Um, I've got Jack Billings. Dane Zorko, the old man himself, Brian Myers or Lionel Messi, as some might refer to him as, James Jordan, Jai Caldwell, Mitchie Owens, Tex Walker, Ben Keyes, Jade Gresham, Lockie Schultz, Elijah Sardis, Liam Baker, our man, Joel Jeffrey, Nat Fife, and Luke McDonald. So obviously, a lot of fucking names there. <laughs> um, yes, everyone. Everyone. So this is sort of where I would consider these... Um, not even flyer types because they're still going to be necessarily like starting on your ground. But these are players that I don't necessarily think you're going to be... I wouldn't be surprised if these maybe find themselves on a waiver wire at certain points throughout the season. 
I'm not calling these guys that are just guaranteed staying in your side for the entire year. So I've got them in a bit of a clump. Depending on where you're getting them, you might be uh, looking a bit more upside, like someone like a Nat Fife down the bottom there. Um, you might be targeting matchups and things with like a Tex Walker. Uh, I do expect him to take a step back. You're looking at potential role changes in someone like a Liam Baker, Elijah Sardis. All of those players, varying levels of risk and upside there. Um, but all in the wash, I think they're all about that 75-ish... 80 at best kind of average. Does anyone in that list really catch your eyes a bit of a surprise or? There's a couple of names in there that stand out to me as being guys that if you're picking these guys up with your last pick and, and it goes right, you could just be home and hosed in your league. Like if you if you pick up, and I'm not saying this will happen, but if you pick up Ben Keys and then Ben Keys for whatever reason becomes a midfielder at the Crows, yeah. well, you now have got a 110... 105 average. Yeah, forward. you've you've got someone you know who I mean? can who can score with the best of the forwards. If you you know Liam Baker, if he ever gets an inside midfield role that's up near 60, 70 percent CBAs, he's gonna be a guy that averages yeah. close to 100. Um, like he's shown that in in even when he's the bloody Swiss Army knife. So like the, these kind of picks, I guess uh, the speculator in me gets excited looking at these picks because you yeah. think, hey, this is where I could really just you know find a diamond in the rough, hopefully. And um, I, I would tend, me. yeah, I would, I would tend to if I if I've locked in one decent forward early on, I would tend to just at this point, you've got very little to lose, I think, yep. um, because you you might just be streaming those forwards and chasing the matchups and things like that. So I'm I'm chasing those guys that if it does hit, it hits big, yep. and there's a potential for them to be in a better role. Um, so. For example, I've got someone like um, like a Jack Billings up the top there, and he'll be good. I think I'm more, more confident in him because he's done it before. He's a guy that can go sort of 80s and things like that, but I don't know if he really excites me. So I might wait a little bit later, see if I can pick up a Nat Fife or see if I can pick up someone like um, uh, a Ben Keys, like you said, or a Liam Baker, some of these guys that, or Mitch Owens, if things all sort of align. Um, I think those guys catch my eye a little bit more. Um but yeah, it, it is chances like chances are none of these guys work out to be honest in terms of like those upsides. But you might get patches. You might get patches during the season where their injuries strike or something like that happens, and you can sort of plug and play them in there. What about a guy like a high up in that tier? You've got Zorko there. Yeah, he's just um. There's like there's some injury yeah. related stuff there. He missed five or six games last year. Is it one of those cases where it's like, well, you pick him, if he gets injured, you know that in the forwards you've probably got a guy that you can plug and play for that good matchup. And yeah. Then, you know, he's just, when he's playing, he's I think when Zorko's sort of out there and he's doing his thing, he's a good player. He averaged 85 last yeah. season. So I am discounting his average from last season a little bit by putting him in this tier. He's 34 years old. I think he turns 20, 35 this year. So... Inevitably, I'm expecting some regression just by age, and his injury history is very scary. So, uh, yeah, I think um, on a per game basis, he probably is a step above a few of these guys. But yeah, it is. I'm taking a lot of that into account. Um, and I, I mean, you've got no Ashcroft there, so maybe his role is a little bit better than chunks of last season. But at the same time, I don't know if the Lions really. You know, would love their season if Zorko is like a heavy feature in their midfield. Yeah, I think that doesn't bode well for the Lions if that's the case. Yeah, I agree. That they're yeah. um, they got a better young brigade coming through there. So, anyone you think that I might have missed, or you, you know, just I trust you to be thorough <laughs> as I want. I want to just quickly highlight the name that I've got at the very end here, Luke McDonald. He's a player that is probably a little bit of a, a really you know deep name. Um, I think that he is a really good player. Um. And he is someone who, with the loss of, um, with the loss of Buddy, did I you think mean Logan McDonald, are you? Did I say? Oh yes, Logan said, McDonald. What did I say? Luke ev- McDonald. Everyone's thinking about the the ruse, and then I've seen you pull up the bloody Swannies. My, my on bad. You. Sorry. Yeah, Logan McDonald is of of course the one I'm talking about. Yes, the key forward for Sydney. I think that he is. I think he's a really good key, young key forward. 21 years old. Obviously, Buddy is uh, retired, so he is going to be their main target up forward. And I can see he averaged 55 last season, and I think his third season as a key forward, which is nothing to sort of you know turn your nose at. Um, so I do think he's uh, he's someone that might go undrafted in a lot of leagues. I think he can be someone that, in the right fixture, can go pretty big. Um, so just a little little late one there that I do want to highlight. Logan McDonald. Not Luke. He's a defender. 
<laughs> you had me off on the garden path. Uh, so yeah, those are the forward rankings. Um, if you don't want any of these guys, I suggest punting the forwards, streaming the category, and praying for some DPP come round six and round twelve. So let us know down in the comment section, guys. What do you think with the uh, all of the rankings? We will be doing. Our last positional video on Sunday this week going through the rucks. We're going to be talking classic and draft rankings all in the one video because we only really need to draft 10 or 12 ruckmen, so it won't take that long to list them all. So tune into that one again. Hit that thumbs up, subscribe button, and until next time, guys, we will see you later. Bye.